Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. We're going to be focusing on rediscovering the kingdom. Everybody say that. Everybody say it again. We want to talk about rediscovering the kingdom. And this is part two for those who were in Toronto last night. And I'm glad you came. Now because so many folks here tonight were not in Toronto, I'm going to do a very brief review of them, and then we're going to get into part two, because I don't want them to miss anything. Our topic tonight is rediscovering the kingdom. Write it down. Our focus tonight is understanding the original message, mandate, and mission of Jesus Christ. Understanding the original mandate, message, and mission of Jesus Christ. What was his original message? What was his original assignment, his mandate? I believe that we have to rediscover this because when Christopher Columbus left the European shores under the Portuguese government and the Spanish governments and he was sent off to explore the world. When he landed in the Bahamas in an island called San Salvador, that began what they call the age of discovery. That is when the West world was born, when he landed in the Bahamas. He began to explore the islands and he ended up visiting and exploring many new territories, including the United States at that time, which was just wild country ran by beautiful people here who were Indians. He also discovered many of the islands in the Caribbean including Jamaica and Grenada and Barbados, St. Kitts, St. Thomas, St. Lucia and Trinidad and Tobago and he went all the way south even down to Guyana and Colombia and he explored and went back to Europe and told the story and then the Spanish came and then the French came and then the British came and, and everyone began to explore and that whole time was called the age of discovery. Well I am here tonight to introduce a new age. It's called the age of rediscovery. Rediscovery means you lost something long time ago and you're going to dig it up again. You're going to find something that used to be present and it was lost. Because I believe that you are the generation that are going to rediscover some things that even some of the late apostles lost. You are living in a time that I am convinced that is so historically important that every time I meet with a group of people, I feel this awesome divine fear. I am afraid that you may not know where you are right now. You might not be aware of what you're doing in this meeting and why God put you in this meeting. First of all, I believe that you are here to rediscover the original purpose of God. What was God's ideas from the beginning? Secondly, I believe you are here to rediscover God's purpose for mankind. Why did God create man? We are here to also discover God's purpose for his creation. Why did God create the universe and the planets? And why did God create our solar system? Why did God create this beautiful planet third from the sun in our solar system and put all this life on it and put all of this beauty on it? What was in his mind? We're going to rediscover God's purpose for redemption. Why did God have to redeem this planet and redeem us? What was his purpose for redeeming us? We also want to rediscover in this time God's original purpose for the church. Why did God create the church? What is the church? And why does the church exist now in the earth? We also want to rediscover, and I believe we will, God's message of the church. We lost it. I'm going to prove that tonight. 
I'm going to prove that the message the church is preaching is not the message Jesus preached. We have somehow distorted the message of Jesus Christ and in most cases lost it completely. We also are the age that will discover the mission of the church. The mission of the church has been so corrupted. We've come to believe that the church existed, first of all, exists to separate itself from the world, which is erroneous, that's not true. We've also been taught that the church exists to prepare people for heaven, totally not true. And we believe, most of all, that the church is a religious organization, totally untrue. I'm going to show you that tonight. As a matter of fact, we reduced Jesus Christ to a religious leader. Totally untrue. Christ is not a religious leader. Never was and never will be. Because Jesus Christ came to earth to do a job that no religious leader could do. I'm going to prove that tonight. I also believe that we are the generation who will rediscover the ultimate goal God has for all of his human race. And that's what every human wants to know. We want to know why we were created. And ultimately, I believe that we are the generation who will rediscover the kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe this is going to be the greatest time to be alive. We're going to reconnect to God's original idea, which we've lost. And that idea is his kingdom. We're going to find out what's in the mind of God. What was God thinking about when he created us? Let me put it this way. I'll write this down. There's nothing more important nor more powerful than an idea. What is the reason for an idea? First of all, ideas are the source of everything. The chair you're sitting on used to be an idea. The shoe on your feet was first an idea. The clothes on your back used to be first an idea. This building was first an idea. This meeting was first an idea. Everything in life begins as an idea. That, that is why ideas control the world. Ideas are more powerful than death. They're more powerful than humans. When a man has an idea, if you kill a man, his idea survives. And this is why it's very difficult for you to try and destroy terrorism. It's an idea. So hunting down bin Laden and killing a man does not destroy the idea. Ideas are more powerful than men. As a matter of fact, here's a real concern. If you try to kill an idea, it multiplies. It is called martyrdom. So the only way to, to deal with an idea that you don't want is to replace it with a better idea. Ideas produce creation. And that is why God began everything with an idea. All things were made by God. All things were made by God's ideas being manifested. Ideas are so powerful that ideas are the source of motivation. When a person does something, there's a reason why they do it. And that reason is trapped in their minds. And that reason is called an idea. Idea is the source of motivation, what makes people act. Therefore, everything God did was because God had in his mind some ideas, some purposes, some, some concepts, some precepts. He had some dreams in his mind, and he wanted to see them manifested. So they began first in his mind, and then he produced them and what he calls creation. What was God's original idea? That's the question tonight. I cannot complete this answer because of our limited time. So I beg you to please get the books and the materials because I don't want you to, to, to walk away saying that you are confused. My job is to shock you back to reality. When you shock people, they feel it. But I want you to pursue that information. What was God's original idea for mankind? I want you to think about this. Jesus came to earth to bring God's idea back to earth. The question is, who is Jesus? Very quickly, let me deal with that. I think he is the most misunderstood human being on earth. 
Jesus came to earth to restore God's idea. That's why he came. Secondly, he came to earth as God's idea. He came to earth not just to bring it. He came to earth as it. Let me take it one step further. Jesus came to earth with God's ideas because ideas are transmitted through words. If you have an idea in your head, I can never know that idea until you speak. So a word is a manifested idea. An idea is a silent thought. It's a picture thought. So ideas are exposed by words. Do you agree with that? So when a person speaks, they are transmitting their ideas. That is why it's very dangerous to listen to just anybody. They are impregnating you with their ideas. Be careful who you listen to. That includes the books you read. Books are simply idea containers. Take heed what you hear. Why? Because you are collecting ideas that can literally create your whole new life. Therefore, the most powerful force on earth is an idea or a thought. And the most powerful mechanism on earth is a word. Ideas are more powerful than armies. And therefore, the most dangerous thing in life is to listen to people's words. Because their words contain their ideas. Ideas are like sperms. Your brain is like a womb. If you're not careful, you will conceive other people's ideas and bring forth a life. That's why when God wanted to change the world, he didn't send an army. When God wanted to heal the world, he didn't send a committee. When God wanted to change the world, he didn't send an army of angels. It's strange enough, when God wanted to change planet Earth, he sent simply the word. What do words contain? Thoughts, ideas. And that is why the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. In other words, the Word is God's answer to the world. What is the Word? Ideas. Jesus came to earth with, with the most powerful element on earth. He came with an idea. And the Bible says all things were made by him. That's verse 2. All things were made by the what? The word. Look at the word, word. Write the word, word down in your notes. Word, W-O-R-D. Please write it down, please. Please write it down, everybody. Now the word, word in that verse, let me give you the exact Greek word that is used. It is the word L-O-G-O-S. Write it down. L-O-G-O-S. The word is logos. So the Bible says in the beginning was the logos. Now what does logos mean? Write this next to it. Logos means actual definition. It means expression of a thought. Expressed thought. Expressed idea. Now look at that verse. It says in the beginning was the express idea of God and God's idea was God and God's idea was with God and God was his idea and God's idea was with God and by his word all things were made oh and verse 14 says and the word became flesh what I like with that is it's telling you that God took all of his ideas and poured it into a dirt body called Jesus. And Jesus Christ is God's complete thoughts walking around on two legs. God's life. You don't need to guess anymore about what God is thinking. He has spoken. Give the word a big hand tonight. Jesus Christ 
is God's complete thoughts in a human body. Jesus Christ is God's original idea on two legs. Jesus Christ is Logos, God's expressed thought, God's manifested idea. So the question is, if Jesus Christ is God's word, which contains God's idea, then what do we need to do to know God's word and idea? Listen to Jesus. Whatever Jesus say would have been God's idea. That is why I believe Jesus Christ is the most misunderstood human on this planet. He's more misunderstood than any other human that existed on this earth. Why? First of all, the Hindus think he's just another God. They got six million of them. The Muslims think that he's just a great prophet who's lesser than Muhammad. They see him as a good prophet who didn't complete the job. So God sent Muhammad to finish it. That's what they believe. That's why Christ, Jesus, Jesus is in the Quran. They don't see him as the son of God, the word manifested. They see him as a prophet. Then we got those who are Buddhists. They see him as a holy man. Then we see those who are, are atheists. They see him as somebody that some 12 men fabricated. They created this man and made him God. Then, of course, we got those who are pagans. They see him as a terrorist and a rebel. Like the Roman Empire saw him as a rebel. He was a, a mischief person. In other words, that's the way the world sees Jesus. And then we got the humanists. He sees him as a highly developed human. A self-actualized human specimen. He was so well developed that he exceeded most men, you know, in his mental capacity. His cosmetic and cosmotic connections with the thoughts of the universe was so high that he had a new relationship with himself. He knew that he was all that was to be a man, you know. That's what Jesus is to an atheist, to a humanist. Worst of all, what the Christians think about him is the worst. <laughs> they think he's a religious leader. If you reduce Jesus Christ to the founder of a religion, you put him in the class with Buddha and Muhammad and Baha'u'llah. If you make him a prophet, you put him in the class with Muhammad and Confucius. He's not a religious leader. Never was, never will be. He never joined a religion. He was never a Pharisee, never a Sadducee, never an Herodian. He was never a Sian. He never joined the Sanhedrin Council, never submitted to Caiaphas the high priest. Matter of fact, his number one opposition was religious people. I put it to you in this courtroom of life that Jesus Christ was not a prophet and not religious. One time, he knew that they were confusing him with the prophets. So he asked them a question. Who do, you, do, who do men say that I am? And they answered, some say you are Elijah, that's a prophet. Some say Elias, that's a prophet. Some say John the Baptist, that's a prophet. Some say one of the prophets, that's a prophet. <laughs> In other words, they tried to reduce him just like they've done today. To being a prophet. And Christ answered, who do you say that I am? He refused those designations. And Peter got a text from God. <laughs> and God texted Peter and said, Peter, tell him this. And Peter read a text and Peter says, I know who you are. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Listen to me, friends. That statement is the most powerful statement on planet Earth. Amen. Write it down, Christ. The word Christ, he Mashiach, means anointed king. 
It's not a prophet. It means anointed king. A king is a politician, not a prophet. Anointed king means someone has a kingdom, not a religion. Thou art the anointed king, the son of God. And Jesus says, upon that statement, I'm going to build my ecclesia. Ecclesia means cabinet or senate. It's a group that's appointed by the king, chosen by him to work with his kingdom. The church, therefore, is God's agency on earth. It's God's senatorial agency. It's God's heavenly cabinet on earth. We are supposed to represent our government on earth, not a religion. The devil has done an excellent job. He has made you think that you are not the state. And so they've drawn a line between church and state. They've made you useless. And that's why your government can make laws and you can't change them. Because you think that that's not your job. I've come to tell you that you are the state. You were sent here by God. When Jesus left you on earth, he left the earth in the hands of his people. He told you to go into all the world and make disciples. That means students of all the nations, not those who are in the church. Oh boy. You're supposed to disciple Canada. We don't know him. His message is completely lost. His status is confusing. His disposition has been destroyed. And we've made him one of the big four Buddha, Confucius. Muhammad and Jesus. He is not one of the big four. He created all of them. Shout amen somebody. He is king, not prophet. Listen, he couldn't be a prophet. Didn't tell you why. Ultimate reason. Because prophets speak for God. You missed that. Okay, let me say it slow. He couldn't be a prophet because prophets speak for God. Christ is God. And this is why you'd hear him say many times, you have heard, but I say unto you. One time they tried to reduce him to Abraham level. They said, we know who our father is. Our father's Abraham. Christ, let me tell you something. Before Abraham was. Come on, give him a praise. I am. Shout amen, Hamilton. Don't reduce him to any of them. He is king. Not a prophet. So anyone who claims to be a prophet, I ain't got no problems with that. Christ never claimed to be a prophet. He said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Every religion in the world is built on Abraham. Christ says, before Abraham was. I didn't come from Abraham. Abraham came from me, he says. Now, why did we miss it so badly? Let me tell you why. Because his message and his philosophy was so different. Let's talk about what he preached, what he taught, what was his message, what was his mandate. Let's talk about what was his, his idea. If he is God's word, which is God's idea container, then what did he say and what did he speak? Well, first of all, let's discover this. Who was Jesus? We need to, need to ask ourselves some question. What was his purpose? What was his mission? His message? His mandate? His priority? What was his goals when he came to earth? What was his reason for coming to this planet? What was his assignment? These are important questions you never ask. You just swallow your church doctrine. Who really is Jesus? What was his message? 
What was his mission? What was his mandate? Let's answer some of these questions, very important. Let's read the introduction of Jesus. He was introduced by a man named John. John the Baptist was his cousin. He was six months older than Jesus. And so they grew up together, they knew each other. And John had a revelation about who his cousin was. John was the first one who the Bible says would go ahead and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. The Bible prophesies that before his face shall come one who will prepare the way for him to come. John the Baptist is that person. Let's read what John the Baptist preached. Now, those of you who are Baptists, let me say to you, John was not a Baptist. <laughs> this is important. So stop blaming John for being a Baptist. John never preached baptism. He didn't preach born again. What did John preach? Well, let's find out. Matthew 3 verse 1 says, In those days, John the Baptist came what? Preaching in the desert of Judea, saying what? Repent! Why? For the kingdom of heaven is somewhere around here already. That was his message. What did John preach? Read it in the Bible, read it. What does it say? He preached what? The kingdom. Is your Baptist pastor preaching the kingdom? Then he's not a real Baptist. John's message is very clear. He preached the kingdom of heaven is here. Then comes Jesus Christ. I wish I had time to talk about this because it's very important to talk about how they got connected. But Jesus Christ actually <laughs> submitted to John. Very important. In those days, they had groups they called master teachers. A master teacher was normally called a rabbi or rabboni in the Hebrew context. But Plato and Aristotle and Socrates were all master teachers. And all master teachers had students. Students, the word for student in Hebrew is the same word, disciple, in Greek. So a disciple is not a religious word. It's an educational word. It means student or learner. All teachers had students. Plato had students. Aristotle had students. Socrates had students. The disciples the students followed their teacher wherever they went. The Pharisees had students. The Pharisees had students. All master teachers had students. John was considered a master teacher. Why? His message was a philosophy that was very clear. And so he attracted students. He had a lot of students in his school. And those schools in those days were mobile schools. They moved. Wherever the teacher went, the school went. And if you attach yourself to a student, or to a, a teacher rather, you became filled with his philosophy. And you become known as his disciple or student. Well, John the Baptist had a school. That was his philosophy, the kingdom of God. Here come Jesus one day, walking in the desert, looking for his cousin, and he saw John. And the Bible says he came to John, and the way you became a student is you had to go through a baptismal ritual. So when you go into the water and you have water uh, poured on you and you come up out of the water, the teacher then separated you from everyone else. You became his student. So when Jesus came, he walked into the water. John said, no, 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 I know who you are. And Jesus said, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, you are my forerunner. I submit to your philosophy, the kingdom of God. And so he went into the water. And John realized that God became his student because of the philosophy, the message, the kingdom of God. The king joined the king school. And Jesus throws him out of that water and the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon him and confirmed who he was. And the voice says, this is my beloved son. Hear him now. In other words, John is finished. He's going to pick up the school. You missed it. And that's why John turned around and John told his students, don't follow me anymore. Follow him because he is greater than I. 
And so Jesus took over the school. What was his message? Let's read it. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, his first message, it's, it's, it's a powerful statement. In Matthew 4, Jesus said these words. His first message, read it for me. It says, from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven has arrived. That was his message. He never preached religion. He preached the country. Jesus' message. Look at this statement here in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 23. Everybody read it loud. Go. And Jesus went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease among, and sickness among the people. In other words, that is what he preached. He preached the kingdom. Now, some of you still don't believe that. So let's just read a few verses to convince you. Matthew 24, 14, read. And Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into the whole world as a testimony to all men and all nations, and then the end will come. The end, he says, doesn't depend on bin Laden or a hurricane or an earthquake. The, the end depends on a message, he says. And every time there's an earthquake, every time there's a storm, every time there's some some drastic mishap in the world, preachers start preaching stupid things. This is the last day. God is coming soon. That's why there's a war in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's an earthquake in China. Mm -hmm. Oh, brother. Hurricanes are hitting all the Caribbean islands and, and an earthquake in Haiti. God is coming. Stop lying to the people. Let's read it again. Ready? Go. By the way, this verse is a response to a question they asked Jesus. Turn to Matthew 24 right now and look at verse 2 and 3. They asked him, when will the end of the world come? That was the question. He answered them in, in, in verse 3 all the way to verse, to verse 13. He says there'll be wars, rumors of wars, there'll be pestilence, there'll be kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, earthquakes, storms, hurricanes, epidemics he says but the end is not yet so stop preaching to these people these fearful things oh Iran and Iraq got weapons what well there's a chip in my phone so what Let's read the words of Jesus again. Everybody go read. He says, but when this gospel of what? The kingdom. Stop. Look at the word this. He said, look, I know you can have your own gospels. The church of God got their own gospel. The Semites of God got their own gospel. Pentecostals got their own gospel. Seventh-day Adventists got their own gospel. Baha'i got their own gospel. Baptists got their own gospel. Here got all those people. Everyone got their own gospel. Catholics got their own gospel. Christ says, look, when this, of what? The kingdom, specific, he says, is preached into the whole world as a testimony to who? All nations. He said, when you do that, then I'm coming back. We don't even know the message. I went to university, went to seminary, got a degree in theology, and there was not one class on the kingdom. And ask your pastor if there's one in his school. He cannot tell you yes. No Bible school teaches the kingdom. No seminary teaches the kingdom. And Jesus said it's the only message that will bring him back. We lost it. But tonight, we are going to rediscover it. We're going to recover it. We're going to bring it back. Shout amen. amen. You're a pastor tonight. You have a rough experience in the next few minutes. Because much of what you learn, you got to throw away. 
I remember going back to my, to my fellowship, and I had been a pastor for a few years. I had hundreds of cassette tapes, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Son, if you don't stop preaching this foolishness and get back to the kingdom, I'm going to leave you. I went back and told our tape department, take every tape of the wall that's not kingdom and burn it. We threw away thousands of them. Are you too proud to come back to the truth? We are so committed to our denomination, we deny Jesus. It gets worse. Look at this verse. 2, 10, 7, read. Jesus is speaking. Jesus says what? As you go, preach this message. Quote, the kingdom of heaven has arrived. He didn't trust us to choose our own message. Look at the word this again. As you go, preach this message. Why? Because you got your own messages, he says. It's rough, huh? This is why I'm very careful about supporting missionaries. People come to me, ask me to, for some mission support for their missions program. And my question is, what are they preaching? Because I don't want to finance error. One of the greatest tragedies on earth is that the church has been effectively communicating the wrong message. Look at Matthew 24, 14 again. He says, what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom to every nation. That's why any missions program that doesn't preach the kingdom is not legitimate. Take a deep breath. Now that's a serious statement. I don't care how good you preach. I don't care how you look dressed nice in your white shoes and white suit and white Bible and white teeth. I don't care how sharp you look on stage with your beautiful padded pews. I don't care how much digital you got in your TV, brother. I want to know what is your message. Very important. What did Jesus preach? What was his focus? He says, blessed are what? Those who are spiritually poor. Why? For them belongs the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33 says what? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Luke 4, 4, you read. When Jesus said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is the purpose I was sent. That's in your Bible. His purpose, he says, was not really the cross. Read that verse. Wasn't really Calvary. Calvary is a means to an end. He said, my real purpose is to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. If you're going to put an church, don't put the cross. Put a crown. Oh boy, I'm in trouble now. He said, my main purpose for coming is to what? To preach the kingdom. Calvary is a means to an end. It's not the end. The resurrection is a means to an end. It's not the end. We've made them the end. We missed the message. We preach Calvary and don't preach the kingdom. We preach the resurrection, but don't preach the kingdom. We preach the blood, but don't preach the kingdom. And he says, I came to preach the kingdom. Take a deep breath. Read. I will give you the keys of a religion called Christianity. Are you sure? 
Let's read it again. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you lock up on earth will be locked up in heaven. Whatever you open or allow on earth, heaven got to allow it too. Because you're the one with the power of the kingdom on earth. That means whatever's happening in Canada is your fault, he says. Oh boy. You so busy trying to get to heaven, the city is going to hell. He said, you're allowing stuff on earth and heaven can't touch it because heaven doesn't stop until you stop it. Heaven can't fix it until you decide to fix it. Heaven supports the agency. This is too deep for you. I know it's over your head. Matthew said, everybody read. Come on, read. I tell you the truth that some who are standing here in this village right now, 2,000 years ago, will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That means it's already here. It came 2,000 years ago. The problem is, if you keep postponing it to the future, you can never experience it now. Whatever you postpone, you can never appropriate. And that's why most Christian people are useless. All they can think about is going to heaven, going to heaven, 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 heaven. What's your problem? If you want to go to heaven, go into traffic. Think about it. God don't want you in heaven. Oh dear, I'm in trouble again. Look at them faces. <laughs> If God wanted you in heaven, so the minute you got born again, he should have killed you right then. <laughs> Quickest way to heaven, boom, dead. <laughs> Deep in your heart, you don't want to go to heaven either. Can I prove it? Why are you taking medicine every time you get sick? Doctor, what's wrong with me? Really? How much is it going to cost? Half a million? No problem. Go to heaven. He wants you to stay out of heaven so badly, he provided healing. As a matter of fact, he prayed to keep you out of heaven. <laughs> you praying to go. I know you're praying to, oh God, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Too much crime in the city. Oh Lord, too much bills to pay. Mm. Oh, these young people go into crazy. Murder, homicide. Oh God, I've been divorced three times. I had enough of it. Take me to heaven, Lord. Oh Jesus, come on, Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's how you pray it. The problem is, he already prayed for you. He prayed this, Father, do not take them out of the world. Now, who's prayer going to get answered? Yours? <laughs> Clap your hands, all you people, and go ahead and just repent. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. So unpack your bags and get busy influencing your city. Give God a hand for impacting Hamilton. We're going to change this city. Shout amen, somebody. Say hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah. Matthew 13, 11, read. And Jesus replied, come on, out loud. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to those who are outside. He wants you to know the secrets of the kingdom. Look at Matthew 13, 24, read. Come on, read. And he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sold good seed in his field. Man, he's preaching. Come on, Matthew 13, 9, read. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the devil himself comes to snatch away what he even begins to understand. Why? The devil is afraid of the message. 
Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like. Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like. Matthew 13, 35, the kingdom of heaven is like. I mean, he preaching. One message, one message. Matthew and Trinity, everybody read this one. Come on, read this one. Not far. Read, 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 read. Go. Matthew 23, 13, read. Woe to you, reverends and bishops and first red reverends, anointed a prophets, anointed peoples. He's attacking religious leaders. He says, woe to you. Come on, say it. Hypocrites. Pharisees, you hypocrites. What he says, you shut the kingdom of heaven up in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter it, nor will you allow those who want to enter, to enter. Pastor, that one's for you. Bishop, that verse is for you. The greatest obstacle for people finding the kingdom is religious leaders he never said woe to a sinner he only woed religious leaders because they are dangerous people they make you think that you are all right they shut the kingdom of God's message up and they themselves won't study it nor enter it. And then they stop you when you want to go to a meeting to learn about it. Oh, some of you will get in trouble after you leave here. Did you go to hear that Dr. Munro? Yeah. Oh, you, you believe that stuff he's preaching? Yeah. And yeah, you ain't come back to this church. <laughs> See, they're going to lock it up. But it's too late now. The people are getting kingdom. Say amen. amen. Matthew 12, 28, read. He sees Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of heaven has arrived on earth. Because that means I've bound a strong man already. Whenever there are miracles, that means the kingdom is present. Luke 16, verse 16, read. The law and the prophets were preached up until John the Baptist. But since John, what's supposed to be preached? The good news of the kingdom is being preached and everyone is trying to find it that means since John the Baptist there's only one message that should be preached not Old Testament types oh man I need more time I just said a mouthful you missed it he says the message that should be preached since John is what the kingdom of God we shouldn't be preaching the Old Testament types. You spend 10 hours preaching on the tabernacle. And it's already gone. The kingdom is here. You spend 20 hours preaching on the feasts. The king is already here and the kingdom already here. He said, preach the kingdom. Oh, I'm in trouble. Look at your face. <laughs> Why don't you read what Jesus said? Don't look at me. Read what he said. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. Rebuke him. He said the law and the prophets were preached up until John. That means the ceremonial law, Levitical laws, burning of incense, pouring of oil, crushing of all these different spices, all the rituals, putting on the cape. He said, all that finish. The kingdom is here. That's why Jesus never wore a holy robe. Because robes in the Old Testament represented types. You couldn't be righteous, so you wore a symbol of it. But now that you are righteous, take your robe off and put on your clothes. Oh dear, I'm in trouble again. That's why they couldn't even distinguish Jesus from the other disciples. He never wore a collar backward. No chain in his pocket to identify him. Don't get me wrong now, if you got that stuff, no problem with me says that we have his righteousness now. 
When they wanted to arrest him, they had to kiss him to identify him. How come they see you coming? The kingdom of God doesn't come by observation. Why? Because I'm a citizen of the kingdom. When you walk up to a person, you don't know what country they're from until they start talking. I work with governments and presidents and prime ministers every single week. I'm somewhere counseling a president, dealing with a government. And you know why? Because I'm not a religious man. They're not intimidated by my presence. Listen, the kingdom of God is within you. It's like citizenship. It's within you. You don't wear citizenship on a badge. It shows up through your culture. That's why he said the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman put in a large amount of flour and it's worked its way all through the flour. You're supposed to influence without intimidating. Yeast is so small, so unintimidating. But when it comes into the flower, the flower is in trouble. The kingdom of God is influenced without intimidation. This is the beauty of the kingdom of heaven. It's colonizing without confusing people. Ladies and gentlemen, let me put it this way before we get ready to close here. It says, when the multitudes knew that they followed him, and he received them, he spoke to them about what? The kingdom of God. How come he keeps talking about this kingdom, and we ain't talking about it? And then he healed the sick among him. Luke 12, 33, read. He says, do not be afraid, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you a religion called Christianity. Why don't we read the Bible, friends? He said, the Father is pleased to give you the kingdom of God. John 3, Jesus is standing before Pilate. He says, Pilate, my kingdom is world. If it were, my servants would fight for me. That means the disciples would try to defend me. He said, but my kingdom is not from this world. I'm from heaven. That's my country. My soldiers fight for me, and my soldiers are not people. They are angels. As a matter of fact, he told Pilate, he says, even now, I could call 10 legions of angels, and they will deliver me out of your hands. By the way, that's a serious threat. Because one of them destroyed Pharaoh's army, just one angel. Imagine 10 legions. A legion is 6,000. No wonder why Pilate says, let's let this brother go. <laughs> this, uh, this, this, this is too heavy for me. Let the brother go. No. <laughs> Give God a hand for the power of Jesus. Luke chapter, Acts rather, chapter 1. After the resurrection, what did he preach? Let's read it. Verse 3. After his suffering, he showed himself... To these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke every day about what? The kingdom of God. How come I never got it in Bible school? That's all he preached. So here's my conclusion. My conclusion is, we've been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. And he told us in Matthew 10, very plainly, verse 7, as you go, you preach this message. Don't preach me, he says. Preach what? The kingdom of heaven. It's right in there. It's right, right in your neighborhood. You can pick it up, get into it right now. That's the message. 
Someone said to me, didn't Paul preach Christ and him crucified? Let's read what Paul preached. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Acts 28. Everyone turn there, please. I'm not going to show it to you on the board. I want you to find it for yourself. Acts 28. What did Paul preach? I can show you many verses, but you can go ahead and just read this one for tonight. Acts chapter 28. Last verse in the book of Acts. Acts is in the New Testament. It's on page 938. Acts 28. Everybody got it? If you got it, say, I got it. Acts 28. What did Paul preach? Look at verse 28. Paul says, therefore, 28, therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been given, has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Verse 30, for many years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and he welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance he preached what? I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you Hamilton. What did Paul preach? The kingdom of God. And then he taught about Jesus Christ. Study your own Bible, friends. Don't let no pastor study for you. So now my job before we leave is to at least define what a kingdom is. We have to rediscover what is, what is a kingdom. What did he mean when he says seek the kingdom? What was his passion when he says go and preach the kingdom? What did he mean? What, what, what was his in his mind when he said that this gospel of the kingdom will preach into the whole world? What, what, what did he mean when he said that you must go ahead and minister the gospel of the kingdom? First of all, he tells us then that the Bible is about a king, a kingdom, a royal family, it's about a government, it's about a kingdom colonization program. The Bible is about a kingdom and not a religion. Whatever Jesus brought to earth, that's what man lost. So study what he bought. What did he bring? We read it tonight. Over and over, he bought a kingdom. Why? That's what man lost. Man never lost a religion. He was never given a religion. God's plan was to extend the kingdom of heaven to earth and to colonize earth with the kingdom of heaven. That was his plan. He wanted to fill the earth with the culture of heaven. That's what kingdoms do. The kingdom colonizes the territory. The territory becomes just like the kingdom. The Bahamas, we speak English because of the British. We drive on the left because of the British. We drink tea four times a day with chocolate. Jello, old chap, fella. You know, that's what we do. Cucumber sandwiches with butter. Yuck. But you see, when a kingdom takes over territory, its culture fills the territory until it becomes just like the kingdom. That's why God created earth. He wanted to fill the earth with his kingdom. As a matter of fact, Isaiah says, verse 45, a verse you never saw before in your whole life, verse 18, write it down. God says, for this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned, he made it, he founded the earth, read it. He did not create the earth to be empty. He formed it to be inhabited. That's in your Bible. He created the earth for colonization. You want to abandon the place he wants to inhabit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can I put this to you? He sent you here to colonize earth. You are not from earth. You were sent to earth. So stop looking for aliens. You are. <laughs> you, you are not from Earth. You were placed 
by your country called heaven. And God wants you to fill the earth with the culture of heaven. As a matter of fact, his original purpose was to establish and extend the kingdom of heaven on earth. He wanted to fill the earth with his culture by putting his sons here. That's you, his people, his citizens, his offspring. That's how the British did it. That's how the French did it. That's how the Spanish do it. Only kingdoms colonize. And they colonize by putting their citizens in the territory. The French came to, to Haiti. The British came to the Bahamas. The Spanish came to Cuba. The Portuguese came to Brazil. And they lived among us. And they made us speak their language and eat their food and wear their clothes. Why? They came and they, like yeast. Don't you get it? It's not about heaven. It's about earth. The Bible is about earth. It's about heaven coming to earth. That's why the first statement of the Bible is, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The whole chapter of Genesis 1 is about fixing the earth so you can live on it, inhabit it. He had you inside of him, but he didn't want you in him. He wanted you in the earth. The Bible says, <laughs> I love it, it says, <laughs> you were in him before the world began. Clap. We don't read our Bibles. We were already in heaven in him. But he took us out of him, put us in an earth suit, and then said, now dominate that place for me with my culture. And you want to go back home, lazy thing. He sent you here because he wanted you to have dominion, not over heaven. So here's your mandate. It's found in Psalm 15. It says what? You are, may you be blessed. Come on, read, read, read with me out loud. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to God. That's his territory. But the earth, clap your hands. Thank God for the, for the wonderful opportunity. He gave the earth to man, he says. Genesis 1, 26, read. And God said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Why? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, of the air, cattle of the field, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the ground. He made you to have what? Dominion where? Over earth. When you go to heaven, ain't nothing to do. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble all over again. See it? John went to heaven, took a visit. John couldn't wait to come back to earth. John said, when I went to heaven, I saw the saints. And they were not dancing or singing. He said, the angels were singing. The saints were weeping, he says. How long? How long? <laughs> how long? How long? You want to go to heaven just to do that? How long? How long? How long, Lord? How long? And John says, I asked the angel, why are they saying that? The angel says, because they are waiting to be clothed again with their bodies. Back to earth. And rule with him forever. You don't read your Bible. You read the hymn books. Take a deep breath. You should have never come here tonight. Why did God create you? Read it out loud. To have dominion. Why did God create you? Say it again. To have dominion over what? The earth. That's why you exist. Now, let, me, let me close with a couple of thoughts here. The word dominion. I did research for you. Write it down. I give you the word. The word dominion used in this verse is the word radach in Hebrew. And it simply means kingdom. Isn't that amazing? Let them have kingdom over the earth. Rada means sovereignty. It means rulership, reigning, power. It means to take territory as an authority. You were created to be 
be in charge. That's why that book over there, I wrote the book, How to Be in Charge. You know, I flew here in my own aircraft. Beautiful jet parked right across there in that private airport. When I was landing, it felt so good. I said, boy, it's so good to have your own jet. Wow. And God says, you're one of my dominion kids. A guy called me the other day on the phone. He said, the Lord told me to give you my yacht. I got a beautiful yacht. Bedroom, living room, dining room, beautiful. Not a cent for it. Parked in the Bahamas. All given to me. Why? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things things shall be added you don't follow God for things you seek the kingdom that's why Jesus never preached on prosperity uh oh take a deep breath take a deep breath quick read the four gospels and see if he ever preached he never preached on it all he preached was the kingdom you know why because when you enter a kingdom Prosperity is not an issue. Because when you enter the kingdom, I mean a real kingdom, the wealth is common. That's why it's called the common wealth. Don't you understand kingdoms? Clap, 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 quick, clap, quick, quick, clap. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. That's why he said, let the weak say, I am strong. And let the poor say, Clap your hands. This is your last day of poverty, your last day of depression. Shout amen. Don't follow Jesus for food. You don't follow Jesus for money. That's religion. You come into his kingdom as a citizen and you got rights to his constitution. Give God a hand for the constitution of the kingdom. The word, the, word, the word kingdom in the New Testament is the word basilia. It means the same thing. It means kingdom, dominion, kingdom. So when you see the word dominion, think of kingdom. Now what is a kingdom? A kingdom is not a religion. A kingdom means to govern, to rule, to control, to manage, to lead, and to administrate and give order back to a territory. That's why he created you. Look at that verse. Write them down, please. The word kingdom means to govern, to rule, to control, to lead, to manage, to take authority over, and to take order, to become the one in charge. You were made to be the leader, not the follower. The ruler, not the ruled. The dominator, not the dominated. That's why you want to be of everything. That's why you hate to owe people money. Because the borrower is a slave to the lender. You're not designed to be a slave. Tell your neighbor, this is it right here. This is the last day of domination. I'm going to dominate from this day forward. Say it loud. I'm a kingdom citizen. I take my position. I'm beginning to dominate. Look how Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 34. He says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, not a car or a house or money in the bank or all claiming all this stuff. He said, but your inheritance is what? The kingdom, which will prepare for you how long? Read it. Give God a hand for the kingdom. The kingdom is a whole... Why do you only want a car? <laughs> oh God, I need a house. God said, what are you talking about? I'm giving you a country. <laughs> Take a deep breath. That's right, every time you breathe, religion leaves you. You've got to keep doing that. <laughs> Real quick. Adam was given, therefore, a kingdom, not a religion. Adam was given rulership, not rituals. Adam was given stewardship, not ownership over earth. Adam was given dominion over earth, not over other men. Adam was given a government, not a religious system. Adam was given royal sovereignty over earth. Adam was given 
the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's what you received in Adam. There's no religion in that list. You cannot lose what you were never given. Say it. So you didn't lose a religion. And that's why religion can never satisfy you. And that's why the few honest people in here know what I'm saying is true. Because see, you get to go home at 2 a.m. in the morning, lay on your bed, looking up at the ceiling in that dark room, just before you go to bed, after singing and dancing and clapping and giving your offerings and all that stuff you go through, listen to the sermon, you lay on your back and you look at the ceiling at 2 a.m. in the morning and you think that last thought, is this all? And you know that's true. That includes you pastors. You preach your sermon, people were happy, gave their offering, you go back home as a pastor, lay on your bed and say, there's got to be more than this. I can't do this for the next 30 years. But the good news is here. The kingdom of God has arrived. You didn't lose a religion, therefore you don't need a religion. And that goes for everybody watching this program. Whether it is your religion, the one you bought, the one you joined, the one you came with, it will never satisfy you. Christ says you are spiritually poor. Then to you belongs the kingdom of heaven. That's what you lost. So let me close on what a kingdom is. What is a kingdom? A kingdom, write this down, is the sovereign rulership and governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his intent, and his purposes, producing a community of citizens who reflect and express the culture, the lifestyle, and the nature of the king. That's a kingdom. I repeat, a kingdom is the governing influence of a king over his territory. He owns it. Impacting it with his will, his purpose, his intent. Producing a community of citizens in that territory who reflect the king's culture, his nature, his standards, his values, his lifestyle. That's a kingdom. A kingdom is not a religion. It's a country ruled by a king. It's a nation ruled by a king. Heaven is a nation, invisible. You can't see it, but it's the original country. And the king is Jehovah, Adonai, Elohim. And he rules and he decided to colonize his own territory called earth. So he placed his kids on the planet and he said, have dominion, dominate that and fill that with the same stuff that heaven has. Put heaven lifestyle on earth. That's the plan. Not religion. A kingdom, therefore, consists of a king's sovereignty and power and authority and rulership and government. In other words, a kingdom, it, it, it actually is filled with this kind of concept. It is a a government, a territory, a country, a nation, it's a people, it's a, it's a rulership of a king. A kingdom is an actual country. It has a culture. You, we missed it. There was no singing in the garden, no choir in the garden, no prayer meetings in the garden. There was no Bible studies in the garden. Read your Bible. There was no prophet and evangelist and pastor and teacher and, and bishop and elder in the garden. There was none of that. No prayer meetings, no worship services. And God says, this is good. I know you're in shock. Take a deep breath. You got to go back and read the Bible. Redemption is a product of sin. 
It's not God's original idea. If man had never fallen, there'd be no need for this meeting. You wouldn't need a teacher to teach you. The teacher would be on the inside. You would know as you are known. That's why the Bible says God will get rid of prophets and prophets and, and evangelists and he can get rid of that stuff. He says the day will come when they shall cease. We've missed it. It's not about religion. It's about a country called heaven. <laughs> a kingdom consists of a king, a territory, constitution, citizens, privileges, laws, an economy, a code of ethics, and a royal favor. When I come back, I'll finish this teaching. Until then, get the books and read. Before I go, let me just say something. I'm going to leave you now. But I want you to do what the disciples did. They asked Jesus a question. They said, Master, how should we pray? Now that you're leaving us, what should we pray for? He said, first of all, don't pray for food and clothes and car and house. He said, matter of fact, Matthew 6, 33, he says, don't even worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, how you will live. He says, don't do that. He says, only pagans pray for those things. Take a deep breath. He just destroyed your prayer list. <laughs> he said, take no thought of these things. Don't pray about food and clothes and, and water and housing. He said, don't pray for those things. But that's all we pray for. He destroyed our prayer list. And then he makes it worse. He says, only pagans pray for those things. Matthew 6. And like I said last night, Sunday mornings are the largest gatherings of pagans anywhere in Canada. We come together to pray for food, clothes, jobs, cars, houses. Oh, Lord, I need some rent payment. God says, I told you not to even think about that. So if you're praying for those things, he says you are a pagan. The word pagan doesn't mean atheist. Paganism was the largest religion in the day of Jesus. It means religious, devout. Only religious people pray for things. Matthew 6. He said, your father know you need those things, so don't pray for them. Verse 33, Matthew 6, he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his right standing in your life. And all these things that the pagans are running after will be added. They'll come after your life. Everybody clap, thank God. Your days of worry and stress are coming to an end. He said, but when you pray, don't pray for those things. He said, pray like this. Ready? Our Father. He didn't say pray my Father. Stop praying for yourself. Bring the whole community to him. Why? It's a country. It's a colony. Our Father, Father, write the word Father down. It's the word Abba. You know what it means? It means source and sustainer. S O U R C E. Father is not a name, it's a title. It means source and sustainer. Abba. That means your source is not on earth. So it doesn't matter what happens to the economy and to the crisis and the global issues. He said, Don't worry about that. I got you covered from heaven. I feel like shouting. If they fire you, I catch you. I still got you covered. If your business collapsed, I still got you covered. I'm your Abba.
our Abba, who is not on earth. That's what he says. <laughs> the source is not on earth. It's in the home country. Don't you get it? Our Father, come on, say it. Who art in heaven. That's the original country. I told you, you an alien. You didn't come from earth. You were sourced from heaven. Holy is your name. Holy means different. You are distinct from any other king. You are sanctified. You are different. <laughs> Others are voted in. You can vote them out. You can't vote you out. You are different. Now watch him. He said, pray this prayer. Thy kingdom come. Hold it now. What is kingdom? The governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his purpose, his intent, producing a community of citizens who reflect his lifestyle, his culture, his morality, his values, his nature, just like him. He said, pray for that to come to earth. Thy kingdom come. The whole country. I will ideas be done. Where? On earth. How? Just like it is in heaven. Give him a praise. He said, that's what I want. He says, stop praying to go to heaven. Pray for heaven to come to earth. So stop singing, I'll fly away. Stop flying. <laughs> Occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. Say it. Occupy until I come. Say it loud. Occupy until I come. Give him a praise. You're about to take over. He said, pray for his culture to come to earth. And that's why you were called here today. This is not a religious book. This is a legal document. That's why it's called a testament. It's not a holy book. It's a contract. It's a constitution. Testament is a legal word. It means a book of law and contract. We use the word covenant. It means contract. It's the constitution of our country. It was sent down to the colony. And then the constitution says in section Corinthians subsection <laughs> sub subsection 5 article 20 it says, you are all ambassadors of Christ. You are not a religious person. The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians subsection 5, article 18, it says, you are citizens of heaven. So you are not members. You can't be members of a country. You're not members of Canada, or members of Jamaica, or members of the Bahamas. You can't be members of a country. Heaven is a country. It says you are citizens of heaven, but you're also being promoted. You are ambassadors of the King, Christ. So you are legal twice. You are dangerous. 
That means you got legal rights to this constitutional promises. Everything in here is rightfully yours by demand of constitution. And that is why you should never beg God for anything. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. You are in a country. You are an ambassador. You are a legal creature. That's why the devil wants you to be in a religion. So you have no rights. And you beg for everything. But tonight, it's over. Religion has left the room. The kingdom of God has come upon us. We are kings and ambassadors. You are royalty on earth. And let me close with an example that changed my life. You are all kings. The Bible says that you are to rule earth as kings. But do you know something? When a king has a son or a daughter, the son is called a prince. The daughter is called a princess. The word prince means first. It means first in line for the throne. The problem is when a king has a son or a daughter, the problem is uh, the son and the daughter got to wait till the king dies for them to become king. This is why Prince Charles is the most frustrated prince in the world. He's mad at everybody. You know why? His mother wouldn't die. That's the problem. So the guy's going to die as a prince. That's why they're talking about William already. They said, William's going to take you. This, this brother, mama's going to outlive the boy. You know, it's true because her mother died at 103 or something like that. You know, ain't, ain't, ain't no hope for, for, for my brother. <laughs> so the prince have to wait until the king dies, or the princess, so that they can become king or queen. Now, the Bible says, you are all sons of God, and he is the king of glory. The home country. The problem is, daddy ain't never going to die. <laughs> this is going to get sweet now. Watch this. So God knows that you can never rule in heaven. That's his territory. And he ain't never going to die. So do you know that in kingdoms, the only way for a king to have his children rule while he's alive is he must first remove them from his territory and put them in a foreign territory. <laughs> so God your father, your Abba, your wonderful source wants you to share rulership with his great leader. So God said, I want the kids to be kings. So he created the physical universe and chose one of the planets. And he released his kids. And he said, have dominion, kingdom over the earth. Rule it. Just like your daddy is ruling heaven, kids. Take charge. Control everything. Master it. And he made kings. 
And that's why he's called the King of Kings. And that's why he's called the Lord of Lords. So tell your neighbor, hello, your majesty. Some of y'all can't believe it. That's why he didn't say it. Try it again. Hello, your majesty. Come on, bow to them. A little courtesy. Courtesy. Come on, bow to them. Your majesty. I feel good. That's the truth. And that's why we came here tonight to rediscover the kingdom and ourselves. Finally, take this with you. An ambassador never represents himself. Ambassadors only represent their government. So if you ask an ambassador about any issue, he would never say, this is my opinion. He would always say, my government's position is, and then he would state it. So if someone asks you about fornication, don't give them your opinion. Just say, my government position is, it is sin. What do you think about adultery? Well, I have no thoughts about it. But my government position is, it is sin. And what do you think about homosexuality? Well, you know, I, I'm not against it. I ain't got no problem with it. But my government position is, it is an abomination. <laughs> now, let me tell you why that's important. If they got a problem with the position, they can't argue with you. Take it up with the government. Yeah. Your problem is you argue too much. From this night forward, you never represent yourself again. You're an ambassador. The kingdom of heaven. I like this one about the kingdom. An ambassador is totally the responsibility of the government. Ambassadors have no bills. You all missed it. An ambassador, the government provides house, car, Food, clothing, toothpaste, soap, water, tuition, tennis balls, golf clubs, air condition. In other words, when you're an ambassador, you are property of the government. I declare from this night forward that you accept your designation as ambassador, and now the pressure's on heaven to take care of your mortgage, your food, your clothes, your kids, and your new building that's coming up. Give God a praise for being an ambassador. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Let the ambassadors stand upon their feet. Shout to the king. Come on, shout to the king. Shout to the king. Shout to the king. Clap your hands, all you citizens. Shout to the Lord. It's a triumph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift both hands in the air. Father, in Jesus' name, I rebuke the spirit of religion. Lo 
loose the people. You foul spirit of blindness. Get out in Jesus' name. In the name of the king, I command you to loose their minds. They are free tonight. Let the kingdom come. Let your will be done in Hamilton just like it is in heaven. Come on, worship the king for a couple of seconds. Hallelujah. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.